You! Ah, wait, you're just in time. Come, take a seat. Don't you pull that may I take your hat, sir, bull honky with me! Why are you in such a good mood anyway? Well, getting a video that's been a thorn in your side for the past year off your chest will do that to you. Not to mention I'm getting the Season 8 review done before Season 9's finale, which is ahead of schedule for this channel. So, yeah, I'm feeling pretty chipper. Well, I feel like I've been through a chipper! I have been out on your front lawn healing for my bloody paste for three weeks! No way! Three weeks?! I knew Wash and Carolina were skilled, but I didn't think they'd mess you up that bad! What the hell happened?! Well, everything was going fine, before Mr. Beck and Black threw a bubble shield over me and, uh... Well, uh... Do you, uh, remember that one scene from Season 10? What the...? I got this. No, wait! <laughs> Ugh, quit laughing! I just forgot that bubble shields work differently in red versus blue. In the games, you can just shoot right through. Oh, face it, Wade. All these years of not being able to die have finally caught up to you. You're getting sloppy, just like Wiz said. Okay, Weisenheimer. And what exactly have you been doing for the past few weeks? In case you haven't noticed, I've been preparing things for the next season review, as well as handling finances with the car-sized hole our dear guests left behind in the last video. Huh? Oh, hey, you're right. The wall's patched up. I hadn't even noticed. Where did you get the money for that? Well, ever since Raccoon Bros channel started to gain more traffic, I got him to donate a sizable portion of his ad revenue to renovations. Wait, you convinced Raccoon Bro to donate money? Not just pledge, but full-on donate? How the heck did you pull that off? That miser is too stingy to get me custom artwork, much less fix a building. Simple. I sent him a strongly worded, yet reasonable letter that quickly changed his tune. Dear Carrick and Namnet, or Raccoon Bro VA if you prefer, as promised, I finally managed to get that Red vs. Blue video out for the channel and I'm hard at work on Season 8. I realize I'm a little behind schedule, which I do apologize for, but I'm going to have to ask you a favor before I can get production truly underway. Our gracious guests from last time left a sizable fissure in the building where I worked diligently on the videos you requested of me for the channel's sake, and I would be forever grateful to you for financing its repairs. While this will be a costly fee, I'm sure you can afford it given the channel's recent growth. Besides, writing the Season 8 review will be hard enough as is considering the video you made a year ago discussing the season's first half. But don't worry, I'm sure it won't be too hard being forced to retread all the points already made by you as well as come up with new things altogether so it doesn't seem like I'm copying you. People adore regurgitated opinions after all. In closing, some shit got busted, I know you can afford it, and kiss that Season 8 video goodbye until I'm not sleeping with a car size draft. Love, Nate. P.S. Your most popular video is a meme that's literally just two different clips put one after the other. How does that make you feel? <sighs> Talent. Welcome back to every episode of Death Battle reviewed in 10 words or less. In our last season review, Holy shit, has it seriously been that long? <clears throat> we talked about what was dubbed the gas leak season of the show. It had plenty of ups and downs, but I felt the ups won out in the end. So despite not being quite as good as season 6, I still enjoyed our overall batch. That being said, there was plenty of room to improve, and from what we were being told, it seemed like season 8 would do just that and then some. Instead of having a single episode celebrating their 10 year anniversary, Death Battle decided to go further beyond and dedicate a whole season to giving us episodes with some form of history that could each serve as a finale in their own right. A tall order to fill given a lot of their actual season closers don't feel like finales, but they seem pretty confident about what they had to bring to the table, even going so far as to take the episode count back to 16 instead of 20 to prioritize quality over quantity, a testament that's held in high regard on this channel. So, were Ben and the crew able to accomplish this mission they set for themselves, and did the show get its groove back after the step down from last season? Let's find out by reviewing every episode in 10 words or less. Ready? Go! Oh, 
I get it, a literal boss fight for Yoda. Poor Shadow, first win and it cost him his waifu. A better fatality than the actual Mortal Kombat episode. Don't go in there, Geese, that's the toilet. All Might versus my guy, minus the personality. Yo, Master, I killed a guy today. It was awesome! Ironic, Steven was Star, and Star was Universal. Okay, nice argument, but can he break a stone pillar? Bruce, where's the watchtower? I see the problem. Oh, do ya? It was me, Nate. I was the one who went past 10 words. Wait a second, I didn't write this. Oh yeah? More like okay. I guess Alucard just went for his last walk. No, the death must be off screen. Think of the children. This is our good Avatar episode. This is it, guys. When are we getting Chair-sama versus Truck-kun? Bald, 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 Wow, I mean, just... Wow, just look at what these beautiful people were able to accomplish. While I wouldn't go as far as to say that every episode could be a finale, and there are plenty of mid and even lame episodes, this is the kind of evolution I've been longing for in this show. The overall vibe gives off this strong air of reverence and care for each of the characters being used. More focus has been placed on their stories, arcs, and why they mean so much to us as an audience. Even the way they switched up the openings by immediately introducing the characters' names just screams respect. Not to mention the animation has taken on whole new levels of bad attitude and scope. It's by no means a perfect season. Something we'll see clearly as I discuss each episode from worst to best. Yes, we're talking about every episode again, because honestly, why not? But I think the further we go along, the more we'll begin to see the blossoming of what could be a new and long-lasting renaissance era for the show. So, let's get into it. Don't you have to talk about Akuma vs. Shao Kahn first? Just give me a minute to cope. <laughs> Akuma vs. Shao Kahn. Like I said, this season wasn't perfect. And yeah, when it comes to fighting game episodes, this one is pretty damn pitiful. Sorry if I sound more disappointed than usual, but not only is it saddening to see a 3D episode miss the mark, especially when it's the Blender crew, Akuma vs. Shao Kahn was a fight that had actually been at the top of my most wanted ideas list for a decently long time. And can you blame me? Both characters defeated villains from each other's franchises, so it's almost like this was a long-awaited conclusion to a four-man tournament. Who is the biggest baddie of the Street Fighter cross Mortal Kombat rivalry? While this episode managed to close the book on that long-standing question, it unfortunately leaves a lot to be desired, save for the analysis segments, which are pretty good. As is customary for most fighting game episodes, it was fun getting to learn about different martial arts disciplines, and even some real-life folklore to help contextualize Oni. Ahem. Wrong Oni. Sorry, couldn't help myself. I was mostly taken aback by the way Akuma's personality was described. On paper, you think he'd be one of the most heartless bastards in fighting game history, but he has a surprising amount of honor when it comes to respecting those who respect martial arts. Not saying he's a stand-up gent, but compare that to Khan, whose biggest con is being too damn cocky, even going as far as to invade our host's airwaves. Impressive for someone who doesn't break the fourth wall regularly. Also, the fact that the other cutaway involves lube and is one of the biggest wisdom boomstick friendship moments of the show is very conflicting for me. Speaking of conflicts, it's time to talk about the animation. It was done by the Blender team, and we all know how well their last close quarters fight turned out. Okay, I'll give this one credit and say it's not as bad as back when, but it's also a lot more disappointing for me when taking several things into account. Like I said before, this is a matchup I'd wanted to see for a decently long time, and in the right hands, its choreography could have been on the same level as Ryu vs. Jin. Not to mention their villain episodes, particularly this season, tend to be some of their greatest work since the characters being used fit so naturally into the death battle environment, giving the writers free reign to be as brilliantly brutal and in character as possible. To be fair, Akuma-Khan does have some moments that nearly reach these heights. I liked the idea of confining some of the fight to a 2D plane, just like the games. There were some interesting moments of choreography, such as the yo-yo move and Khan's mid-air reversal, and Philip Sacramento gives one hell of a performance as Akuma. The Satsui no Hado is mine! This isn't the only time you'll be seeing him this season, by the way. And the same goes for Khan's VA, the ambassador of Impact Font memes himself, Gianni Matragrano. Grano? Grano? Eh, whatever. And after all these years of being this show's Sean Bean, he finally got his first win! Too bad this is one of his weaker performances. The acting itself wasn't bad, it just didn't fit the character. You dare interrupt my tournament. Another fool seeking my throne. 
There's barely any gravitas to his voice, and it's too smooth. He just sounds like some throwaway lackey, which wouldn't be that big a deal if it weren't for the fact that Khan has one of the most iconic fighting game voices in history. Might have shot yourselves in the foot a little there when playing his voice clips beforehand. Just saying. Even his performance in anime rap battles sounds more intimidating. Not so dandy after all. <laughs> As for the animation itself, we are shown once again why these kinds of fights don't sit well with the Blender team. I understand why it had to be done. The sprite team was booked enough as is, and the in-house 3D team had been pretty much MIA. It was an unfortunate situation that sadly shows in the fight. There is barely any weight to these hits. Not unlike back when, the models are too damn floaty, removing any sense of impact. It doesn't matter how hard the punches sound when it doesn't match with what's being shown. Half the time, the models ragdoll so much it didn't make Gary's mod blush. And most of this ragdolling is safe for Akuma because this dude gets barely any moments to shine. Shin Akuma literally got two hits in, Oni was treated like a bitch, and anytime he did get hits in, Khan practically no-sold them. The effects are no better, and look tacked on in a way that even an editing novice like me could replicate. There's like one, maybe two shots that actually look kind of cool. Everything else is cool on paper, but gets decimated by janky movement and unsatisfying interaction. Take the death, for example. Khan stopping the raging demon would have been cooler if A, we could actually see the damn move, and B, he didn't do it in a way that made Oni look like a total pushover. And why the hell would they make his death happen off screen? It's Mortal Kombat for Pete's sake! What is it with this franchise getting so many lackluster finishers? I also have to deduct points for forcing us to look at Khan's ugly mug, which looks like a Ninja Turtle from the Michael Bay films. And just look at the background! What's that? You can't? Well, that's probably because it goes completely missing halfway through. Even back when gets this right. At least the back cave never disappeared during the fight. Whoa, 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 Nate, buddy. Yeah? Just repeat after me. Akuma Matata. What? Just trust me. Akuma Matata. <sighs> Akuma Matata. Feel better? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Good, because you still have another bad 3D episode to talk about. Mother Bland is secretly an alley cat, which is fitting because she belongs in the garbage. Bland versus Mikasa. Now, before we get into the episode proper, I find it important to note that I recently got caught up with the Attack on Titan anime, and yeah, it's a great show. Stellar animation, mind-blowing twists, people who say it's overrated have clearly only seen the first season. But I wasn't a fan of the show yet at the time this episode released, and as a casual observer slash Bland hater, I thought the episode was... Fine. Fast forward to present me, who had to rewatch this episode for review purposes. He loves Attack on Titan and still finds it enjoyable to dunk on Bland whenever the opportunity arises. This logically means that I would either love or despise it way more than beforehand with my newfound knowledge of AOT. Surprisingly, my opinion on the episode hasn't really changed that much. Aside from taking a bit more umbrage with the analysis grinding to a screeching halt with that terrible fart joke. Don't mistake me for a stick in the mud. Fart jokes are great in the right environment. But was the episode talking about Attack on Titan? really the place for it. Other than that, the analysis segments are fine. It doesn't help that I really just don't care for Bland as a character. And now that I'm a fan of her anime, I'm realizing now that they could have gone way more in with Mikasa's analysis considering it was AOT's first episode. Like, sure, they talk about the equipment and Mikasa's loyalty to Eren, but that's merely the tip of the iceberg with what this series has to offer. Also, thanks for including this gigantic spoiler of a feat that had no bearing on the analysis. Like, at all. Though I did like the first cutaway quite a bit. Between this and the Mahler twins, there's something about frivolous cloning that I find to be quite entertaining. Also, Clone High is always a win. As for the animation, my opinion on it is mostly the same, but a lot more little things have crept up that annoy me. Remember, the most important part of any death battle is the crossover aspect, and this episode hardly delivers on that with interactions that are shallow at best. Like, I can kind of understand Mikasa being this forceful towards a civilian when trouble is afoot, but why is Bland being so aloof? What's stopping her from being like, no kidding, I'm a hundred? Where's the shit going down? And to answer your question, Mikasa, no. Bland isn't deaf. But she might be mute considering her dialogue is limited to recycled voice clips and fighting game grunts. Leave me alone! Leave me alone! Can't you say anything else but... Leave me alone! Incoming! 
which is a thousand times more noticeable when Mikasa has a voice actor specifically for the episode. This isn't a Crash vs. Spyro or Link vs. Cloud situation where it's okay to use recycled voice clips for one character who doesn't have much to say to begin with. It completely undermines the dialogue potential and turns this into the Mikasa show. To be fair, Francesca Callo is a pretty good sound alike for Mikasa and gets some pretty intense moments to shine, though not too many considering how laughably bad most of her lines are, such as this little classic. Are those two sets of ears? She must have four times the hearing. That doesn't make sense. Also, really? Bland played by Aaron Zek? By that logic, we might as well have said Wario played by Charles Martinet or Ryu played by Kyle LeBear. Fortunately, the fight choreography does pick up some of the slack, which is a given since this baby was produced in-house. But if this really is the last in-house 3D episode we get, that will make me pretty sad. For every intense scuffle and badass sweeping shot that replicates AOT, we get plenty of jank to cancel it out. Yikes. And I thought I had a bad case of the T-Rex. Despite how dumb a lot of the dialogue is, I appreciate the little strategy monologues Mikasa gets. It's very Attack on Titan, and I hope to see more moments like this in the future where we really get a glimpse into their headspaces. And the climax is pretty great for what it is. This visual reference looks pretty, and the way Bland redirected the Thunder Spear was a super creative way to finish things off. Though I still find it a little weird that she didn't lose her aura despite getting hit by one directly. Actually, I'm pretty sure she did lose her aura. Seriously? Yeah, the sound effect played in everything. But look at the visuals! That's the wrong effect, oopsie! <laughs> How in the heck did they- Nobody knows! Getting back to the death, I've seen a lot of folks comment on this image of Mikasa being hilarious. Ah! And like, I don't really get it? I don't know, I'm mostly partial to this malformed silhouette that I have to assume as a Titan showing up, followed by Bland playfully running towards it with no aura to speak of. Look, I don't care how much plot armor you have, that chick is dead. And what Bland vs. Mikasa discourse would be complete without at least mentioning Thunder Shroud? It's goddamn beautiful, and does wonders in elevating this episode's status. Unfortunately, nothing else about Bland vs. Mikasa quite stands on the same level as its track. As cool as the fighting could be at times, it mostly gets undercut by a lack of personality and repetitive choreography that relies too much on bland semblance. So repeat stuff, repeat stuff, repeat stuff, repeat stuff, repeat stuff, repeat stuff. And I'm not the only one who feels this way. I'd like you to meet Zachary Lyon, renowned Isabel player and one of Raccoon Bros roommates who has appeared on the channel before. He's also probably one of the biggest Monty Owen bands I know. I was hoping the animation would be a bit better. <laughs> 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 so he has a bit of a bone to pick with this episode, which I thought would be fun to include. Welcome to the show, Zach. As Nate introduced me, I'm Zachary Lyon. Now, I've known Carrick for a while, and regrettably, I've been entrusted to help with this segment. Now, he showed me this death battle a long time ago, and when I first saw it, something caught my eye that's been bothering me since. It might seem like a nitpick, it might seem like an overreaction, however, it violates a rule that, in my opinion, is incredibly sacred when it comes to fight choreography. Not breaking that sense of disbelief. Most fights can get away with it, if it's in terms of stylization, if it services the story, or if the action is so damn good, it doesn't actually matter. Unfortunately, Blake vs. Mikasa didn't have enough to offset that for me, and I'm specifically referring to one moment that happens in the latter half of the fight. Did you catch it? Mikasa, having plenty of time to draw her blades, opts to just punch Blake instead of a fatal stab. It was shown just previously she had more blades, and they also showed off her reaction and swing speed time. Like, it would have been more than enough time to deliver a stab. I don't get it. What was she doing? She could have been there instantly. I have a feeling they wanted to show something really cool that Mikasa is skilled enough to do, but it's at the cost of something that, in the context of the fight itself, would have been pivotal to the outcome. There are so many other death battles that are able to sustain that sense of, wow, this is fucking crazy and really happening, while having plenty of things that don't make a lot of sense. I really wish this kind of thing didn't have to pop out to me as much as it did, but for me personally, it's such a make or break moment that it drops the quality of the fight way down from what it really should be. It might seem kind of cringe that I'm losing my shit over such a small thing, but I've had to seethe for over a year about it, so please, please let me complain just a little. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thanks for the input, Zach. Here's hoping they do Roy Mustang versus Levi Ackerman at some point. Then we get to redeem two franchises in one go. Hey, Nate, I just realized that after this entry, this will be the last time you get to make fun of Ruby for a while. Anything else you want to get off your chest? Blanche should have been with Son. There's no meme, is there? Uh, yup. Oh, yeah. 
Macho Man Randy Savage versus The Kool-Aid Man. Man, talking about this one just makes me feel bad. It's clear that a ton of effort was put in, and I always feel guilty disliking things that are experimental and trying something new. But that's the thing with taking risks. They don't always work out. Starting with the good stuff, the parts of this death battle that actually focused on well, the death battle were super enjoyable. Not only does the presentation have a unique style befitting of these fighters too cool for school attitudes, but it was enjoyable hearing them talk about Randy Savage's wrestling exploits both in real life and in fiction. So, just fictional the whole time? Chill, dude, you're gonna set off the wrestling fans. Just as fun, anytime death battle takes a character as unconventional as the freaking Kool-Aid Man and recontextualizes his absurdities into actual feats is fun as hell. In short, the analysis has major Chuck Norris slash Smokey Bear vibes. Jocelyn and Dummy were a delight as always. Them giving the analysis results was a nice change of pace, and I'm convinced that Dummy is slowly but surely turning into Lopez. Those two just feel like kindred spirits, if you ask me. Pose Macho Man didn't have the thirst to win. Was that a joke? <sighs> Do you have an off switch? Yes. The fight animation may have been a tad slow pace, but with it being hand-drawn, we knew it was a given that the imagery would at least be eye candy. Though I don't think anyone was prepared for how amazing this stop-motion-inspired section would look. If they could make this work for a whole ass episode, we'd be eating like royalty. Anthony Sardina is a joy to hear as Randy Savage. He captures the energy of a wrestling star completely lost in the moment perfectly. That's just the power an intercontinental heavyweight champ like me brings to the ring, oh yeah. And despite not having many lines, Tom Shulk isn't half bad as our liquid legend. Oh yeah! Did someone say thirsty? If the episode was focused on just this stuff, we'd be seeing a much higher score. Sadly, a lot gets bogged down by the forced in story arc that had been built up to all season. It has good intentions, believe me, I get it. But the whole script feels like a first draft that didn't get many edits. Oh lord, I have to do another Mr. Plankett segment, don't I? <laughs> Why does Marshall not know if his dad or the tip guy is the one in red? It was clearly just there to force Boomstick into thinking Randy was his dad. How does the mask play into all of this? He gave the letter to Boomstick before, so what the hell did the letter say if it was from his dad? Sarge didn't even realize he had a son. But that doesn't make sense either because Sarge had clearly already put two and two together back in Meta vs. Carolina, so why does he act so surprised? While it is funny and quite quite frankly Chad-like of Randy to wait until death to clear things up. Why didn't he immediately deny it? How did he know Boomstick's dad was here in the first place? What's his relation to Deadpool? Why was Sarge there to begin with? For that matter, why was Boomstick's mother there? Does she live there? Clearly she doesn't because otherwise why wouldn't Boomstick know? Did Randy tip her off too? Seriously, what is Randy's relation to Sarge? As much as I love the analysis, why did Wiz and Boomstick feel obligated to go into a full-on rundown. Is this something they would do to literally anyone new they meet on the street? That's gotta be kind of embarrassing. Seriously though, at least with Randy they have somewhat of a transition leading into the history stuff, but when Cooling Man shows up they just go right into things without any prompting at all. And I know what some of you might be thinking. You're a Red vs. Blue fan, you must have loved the Sarge cameo. Well, I would've if it was given some semblance of context. Or went literally anywhere? The end result just made the Boomstick's dad arc feel kind of pointless. The cameo also would have been more of a pleasant surprise if the crew didn't spoil practically everything other than the winner with its marketing. Listen, I don't hate this episode. I have a lot of fun with the analysis and power sets. I don't even hate everything about the story. Boomstick's mom gives a meaningful message about appreciating what you have instead of dwelling on what you don't. I also love the idea that Randy and Kool-Aid Man spar on a weekly basis. What's doubly fun is the implication that they always bring each other back to life afterwards, given Randy's elbow drop has resurrected others in the past. Also, to anyone who says this episode is disrespectful to Randy Savage's death in real life, Stop it. I want to like this episode more, but the more time I spend thinking about it, the more it starts to fall apart. Making this anniversary special feel middle of the road to me. At the very least, you were nice enough to do Boomstick a favor, really keeping with your character development there. Eh, I figured if everyone who watched Meta vs. Carolina knew who Boomstick's dad was, he might as well know too. Yeah, I've been meaning to ask about that. Is Sarge actually his dad? Cause I feel like not even he knows at this point. Ugh, look man, this show has like a hundred different writers. Don't think about it too much. I was just lucky that shotgun-legged hillbilly didn't assume I was his dad. <laughs> you sly dog! You got me monologuing! I can't believe it! It's cool, huh? 
Zero point energy. Lex Luthor versus Doctor Doom. I'll be honest, I sometimes forget this episode exists, which I suppose checks out seeing as it's another Marvel versus DC fight. To its credit, it's one of only two this year, a surprising amount of restraint compared to last season. Perhaps the DB crew caught wind of this fatigue and realized it was time to kick the comic episodes into high gear. It's this episode where we start to see the beginning of some amazing panel editing both for comic and manga characters. We got a glimpse of this style before with stuff like Rock Lee versus Sanji and Hulk versus Broly and these edits alone have completely revitalized my excitement in Marvel and DC fights. It means we get to see more of these sick visuals that ironically breathe life into these still images. Although there was some room left for improvement, some of the sound effects were pretty overbearing and distracted from the commentary as opposed to complimenting it. I also can't stand how they fucked up the mind swap plot. I realize this is probably a nitpick to most, but anytime a show does the body swap plot and swaps the voices too, it immediately loses me. It's not even because I'm concerned with the logic of it. When you love voice acting, as much as me, it's a serious missed opportunity. I love seeing castmates getting to do impressions of each other and seeing how other characters react. Not to mention you don't have the plot hole of how is nobody else noticing these two clearly have swapped voices. No, don't eat me. I'm a man trapped in a pig's body. That's what they all say. I mean, honestly, it makes no practical sense at all. If I could run an experiment proving this, I would. Well, there's no time like the present. Where did you get that? Don't ask. Now we will prove once and for all. If voices swap with minds. Three, two, one, go! Ah, what do you know? Looks like Sonic Boom was right after all. Also, dang do I look good. My biggest regret has always been not seeing myself perform live. Dude, change his back. I feel like burnt leather ran across sandpaper. Relax, gorgeous. All I gotta do is press this button and... Your free trial has expired. Uh, give me a minute, I'll, uh, figure this out. Just keep the review going! No, wait, come back, this is too esoteric! And he's gone. <sighs> well, the show must go on. The absolute best thing in this episode's favor is the veritable versatility on display. All the insane gadgets being used is a far cry from both of these megalomaniacs' previous outings. In those episodes, it felt like we barely scratched the surface of their arsenals. Here, the gadgets play in this episode's back and forth momentum expertly, constantly keeping us on our toes and accentuating the idea that the results came down to who had the better hacks. The setup is interesting, the foot dive joke lands, stuff like the 2D trap are super cool looking, the hand drawn moments are sick, and the 3D background is fairly well implemented. What unfortunately kills this episode is the dialogue. Remember that back and forth momentum I mentioned? Well, the pacing of it doesn't always hold up, as those cool gadgets are constantly being expositioned by the characters, with Shakespearean flourish to boot. It's kind of like when you find something in Skyward Sword and the game grinds to a screeching halt to explain it to you. Zelda, will you show me? This flower going into my inventory and then taking off one on where it is. Thank you. <laughs> Even if that item is already in your inventory. To be fair, it is in character for these two, considering how much they like to hear themselves talk. Gianni's reprise as Lex was a much more improved performance in my opinion. Not that he did badly last time, but it felt like he was trying too hard to do a Clancy Brown impression. Let me tell you something, Stark. There's only one man in the world fit to play such a role. Whereas this time he sounds more naturally slimy and bureaucratic. That Viria. What an exquisite place to start a corporatocracy. Stephen Kelly as Doom is a controversial choice, but I didn't mind it that much. Even if it does feel a little derivative of his Dracula voice. Mr. Luther, your company has invaluable resources for the people of Latveria. I will be seizing them. But what is a man? A miserable pile of secrets. Honestly, I wouldn't mind the dialogue so much if it wasn't so nonsensical most of the time. Why is Doom so surprised by Lex having an extra set of armor? This dude fought Tony freaking Stark! And Lex's response feels like a lesser, more poorly worded version of Beerus' epic finisher. And it stacks up pretty poorly in comparison. Impossible! Impossible? <laughs> that word has no meaning for someone like me. What about you? That's... Impossible! Now you're catching on. I am the impossible! Lex at least redeems himself with the Superman comeback, even if his jaw looks a tad dislocated. The obligatory Man of Steel reference was there, and Doom gets a decent line right before easily one of the funniest screams in the show. It has the same energy as Sonic the Werehog's death scream. It just kind of throws you for a loop how out of nowhere intense it is. 
I wouldn't be surprised if part of that frustration comes with getting his second loss on the show. Now he has as many L's on death battle as he does in his initials. While this episode isn't nearly as bad as some claim, the clunky dialogue and odd pacing brings it down quite a bit. A mechanical wrench called the Lex Box, you knuckle dragging buffoon. Two dimensional morphographic technology. This is the most obnoxious thing I've ever experienced in my life. It ends up making moments that sound cool on paper have a muddled execution. This can be seen more clearly in the final moment where they use one of Doom's most iconic lines. This power, it's like that of the gods, beneath me. On its own? Yeah, it's raw as all heck. But they forgot to make it make sense in the battle's context. Of all the episodes this year, I've seen this one get some of the most hate. A bit of that likely coming from Salty Fate fans. But I think it has enough positives to say that I enjoyed it overall. Save for some goofy faces. Besides, it's Marvel vs. DC. I'm not losing that much sleep over missed potential. Alrighty, I'm back, and I just got another free trial started on this bad boy. 70 alternative accounts for the win! Aw, can I at least try out your healing factor? I just who's going to be stuck with the dry cleaning? Oh, how I've missed you, tumorless body. So, Nate, did you learn any valuable lessons about friendship today? Um, don't overly rely on free trials? Eh, it's more than I was expecting. I'm not wearing underwear. Shadow the Hedgehog versus Ryuko Matoi. As far as Shadow episodes go, we might as well consider this one god tier. For you see, unlike his previous episodes, he's actually treated with some modicum of respect. It's pretty forgettable otherwise, but it's still alright. I liked hearing them talk about the Sonic universe, and hearing Shadow's origin gets me even more hyped for the third Sonic film than I already was. Kill la Kill is one of my favorite anime ever. The ludicrous animation and over the top characters are memorable as hell, and it somehow manages to incorporate fan service in a way that's integral to the plot and overall theme. So it was fun hearing Wiz and Boomstick talk about that universe too. Forget the Boomstick's dad arc, when are we going to get answers on this Wiz's married plotline? I like the animation fine enough, but for as much as the sprite team was talking up the Studio Trigger inspired visuals, the whole battle felt kind of tame. True to Shadow's speed, the fight comes as soon as it goes, and while it doesn't leave much of an impact, I appreciate this fight for a lot of little character moments, particularly on Shadow's end. You've got the empty gun, the faker callback, his iconic time kick, and him being unimpressed by Ryuko's changing clothes. Ryuko better step aside and watch a true streaker at work. At least he's wearing shoes and gloves. That's more than I can say for some Sonic characters. Brendan Blaber takes over as Shadow in place of Curtis Arnott, a purely creative choice to reflect modern Shadow. And Mr. Apocalypse is quite good at selling the ambivalence and even slight dorkiness of the character. Time to end this. Behold my power! <laughs> Baker. Besides, Curtis would be getting another, equally edgy, red and black wearing, gun-toting role later on. <gasps> and no, Wade, I wasn't talking about you. I wasn't gonna say anything. Idiot. Yes, you are. As great a job as they did redeeming Shadow, Ryuko's character took a bit of a nosedive. As much as Jenny Yokorobi nails the edginess, Ryuko's overall tone is kinda one note. You don't get a sense of her camaraderie with Senkets at all, and her dialogue makes her feel too much like a bully. <laughs> Did your mommy pack that sword for you? Though I do like Tom Laughlin's voice. He's anticipating you. You should anticipate him instead. Well, no shit. The hand-drawn stuff and sprite expressions are a pretty mixed bag, with some faces being downright ugly. The biggest thing holding this one back is the pacing. It's too damn short, and the choreography leaves as much of an overall impact as the sound design. Oh yeah, that's ass too. Shadow going super is completely unprompted, and they end up in space faster than Captain Marvel and Shazam. I could buy the idea that Shadow went super to get things over with because he was annoyed, but this concept is pulled off much better in Ghost Rider vs. Lobo because you actually get an idea of his slow rise and frustration. We don't get that as much here because Ryuko eats up a lot of the screen time. Luckily, the climax looks pretty awesome, and it's so damn cathartic seeing Shadow finally get to shut down the one word that's been haunting him for the last 10 years. Even if it's a vaporization death, which we'll be seeing a lot more of in this list, I was at the very least satisfied enough with Shadow getting a proper run back. Fine for what it is, but not an episode I feel the need to revisit that much. I'm the coolest. Holy shit, you fucking killer dude! Yacht Queen Spray! <laughs> Korra vs. Storm. To those who consider themselves close members of the Versus community, like myself, can we agree that the announcement of this matchup might have been one of the most unabashedly insane riots we might ever see? No! Never forget. No! 
in retrospect, Storm really was Korra's best opponent, even if it is a stomp. Delson getting in before Cole is stupid as fuck, and if you thought Korra vs Storm was toxic, have you seen The Last Jedi Discourse Online? Despite the ludicrous uproar, this episode came out pretty good, and I was surprised by how much I thoroughly enjoyed the analysis portions on both ends. I didn't even mind all the talk about Queen shit because they actually showed these characters doing Queen-worthy things. Despite Avatar having a poor track record fight-wise, I always look forward to hearing them talk about this world, except when I don't. Despite not watching her show, I really appreciated how respectful they were of Korra's PTSD and self-doubt issues. I'd also like to learn who that guy was that invaded the booth in the beginning. They're a hoot. While Storm's section felt a little lacking in terms of discussing her character, saving that mostly for the beginning and end, hers is also great and uses that same panel editing I mentioned before with Lex vs. Doom. My personal favorite being this little eye roll. Even the sound design addresses the issue I had with that episode, feeling much less distracting. These cutaways are also really freaking funny, the first one in particular being super imaginative. Wiz being thorough enough to amputate the leg is also a neat touch. Oh yeah, and It's Always Sunny is always a win. The best word to describe this animation would be cinematic. I mean, just listen to Weather the Storms. It might as well be from a big budget movie. These two have some pretty neat chemistry, with Storm mostly wanting to test out Korra's abilities like a teacher, while Korra isn't afraid to show off and get stylish. Storm even pays Korra respect after the finisher, which is a much more fitting reaction than just woohoo, murder! Where were you on that one, Aang? This character work is elevated by some super expressive sprite art and some of the most memorable shots of the season, with this splitting of the waves being a particular highlight. But my favorite scene is without question this moment when Storm finds herself in the Valley of Fog. It was way past cool seeing not only silhouettes from hers and Korra's pasts, at least that's what I'm assuming, but also a couple cameos from previous Death Battle victims. That is a really awesome easter egg they didn't have to include, and while Shara Kirby does a great job throughout, she really shines with Storm's monologue. Scott Jean Logan, I won't let you down! Amanda Jelena Gonzalez is also a good voice actor, even if I would have personally imagined Korra with a slightly deeper voice. Water lightning and airbending? Starting to feel a little less special here. You'd think I love this episode, but there are some slight hiccups that keep it from great territory. There are a handful of jank moments, especially when these rocks and traps storm. Just look how choppy it is. But more significantly, the battle in and of itself doesn't have that much to work with due to being so much of a shit stomp. Oh, I'm sorry, queen shit stomp. To the point where they couldn't even hide it as early as the analysis. Over 15 are you? <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> <Can> you <think> <laughs> It's why Storm doesn't get many hits in, because otherwise she could end the fight in a single blow, leaving us with two power sets that don't bounce off each other super well and little memorable choreography. Brain blast! <laughs> oh no. Nonetheless, I was still pleasantly surprised by the episode overall. It being in the season's second half certainly helped, given that's when Sprite Fights got to be a bit longer. I'm happy the streak of poor Avatar episodes is over, but I'm even more happy about a certain cameo that appeared in the Valley of Fog, the community's very own Nemesis Bloodreich. So Nem, how did it feel to be featured on Death Battle? Do I know you? Stop ignoring me. Piss off. Check it out, this is my new Steven Universe Crystal Gem cosplay. <laughs> God. Steven Universe vs Star Butterfly. Okay, I know all you Mother Hubbards love making the Steven Universe and Undertale comparisons, but this fight is literally the pacifist vs genocide roots. <laughs> what did you think was gonna happen? I never dread any episode of Death Battle. The worst is just me not being that invested. Steven Universe is a show I absolutely adored until I didn't, and I dropped Star vs the Forces of Evil at the beginning of Season 3, which is apparently before it started to quote unquote dip in quality, but the analysis segments were still a good time. Stevens has some odd pacing issues, what was starting with a calc before even name dropping him, but I think they did a good job introducing these two new franchises, and there were some pretty fun lampshading moments such as, like I stated earlier, the whole genocide thing. And I thought Attack on Titan was bleak. Oh, and in case you're wondering, that isn't your mouse, consider this a kiss cartoon oopsie. Everything about the way this fight starts is perfect. The Sandcastle contest and prize money is a pretty fun callback. You have merchandise? Yeah, I get a $650 royalty check every month. Steven is shown being a patient artist, as well as setting up the Watermelon Army for later, while Star is being brash and tries the easy route, which must be the premise of at least half the episodes in her show. Steven may be annoyed, but he does his best to defuse the situation calmly, while Star, having good intentions, makes things a lot worse. It made the fight between these two feel surprisingly natural, and their personalities play off each other really well in the first half. Steven continues to show off his compassion when encouraging his Watermelon Babies, and Star remains joyfully oblivious throughout. Plenty of fun dialogue moments and two transformation scenes that give a pretty good vibe check when it comes to sanity. Steven going pink is genuinely chilling when he gets a PTSD flashback that really makes you feel for the poor guy. Just leave me alone! 
funny how the exact same line was used last time, yet it fits so much better here. It's greatly elevated by Caden Jensen's performance, who embodies Steven's awkward playfulness and mental fallout really well. I also just find it rather fitting that Steven should be played by a trans BA here, given how much ground was broken by his show when it comes to LGBT representation in kids' media. Eat your heart out, Disney. I can't think of anyone better to play star than Corin Sudberg, aka Megami33. It's a near identical match, and she turns seemingly normal lines into comedic gold. What did sandcastles ever do to you? Hmm, I don't know. Not so comical, though, is the second half of the fight, and I like how deliberate this contrast is. We get more serious summons, including the motherfucking spider with a top hat, and get a pretty cool battle with a climax that ends up coming down to defense versus offense. Some people were a little miffed by the ending leaning too hard into Star's propensity for destruction, but I feel like her progression in the fight is pretty reflective of her behavior in the show. I wonder if that means she's given someone boobies before. Unfortunately, as fun as it is to see their unique abilities bounce off each other, there was something about this animation that felt missing. I understand they can't put in hundreds of spells, and if this was hand-drawn, it'd likely be even shorter, but... I don't know. It didn't feel like I came out of this fight as fulfilled as I could have. There's even some cut storyboard bits that would have greatly benefited the amount of content, as well as give us a hand-to-hand -hand fight on the rainbow that didn't look as stiff as cardboard. The sprite work itself, while containing plenty of beautiful shots, leaves a bit to be desired. There's some odd lip-syncing, janky movements, and a lot of moments that felt like the rigs were being pushed to their limit and not being able to hide it. Don't get me wrong, though, this episode is still good, with plenty of standout elements. Stars of the Universe is a wonderful track that helps accentuate the tone which I brought up before, but much like the fight, I wish it was longer so that more moments had time to sink in. Be that as it may, there's still enough love and determination in this episode overall to crack the top 10. How many more times do you think we'll hear Wiz and Boomstick discuss puberty, by the way? Hey, Plankton, can our first song go like this? And then turn into one of those songs that goes... Perfect. Batman versus Iron Man. Okay, what the heck were they thinking with this mid-season announcement? Season 7's was so freaking perfect! Beerus has so many different and viable options when it comes to opponents that it made the summer-long wait super fun for speculation. Meanwhile, not only has Batman been on three times already, but there was actually zero debate on who he would fight. The only exciting thing going into it was seeing the Hellbat in action for the first time in a form other than comics and easter eggs. I'm still glad they did this matchup, I just wish Batman's last episodes didn't exist. Not because they suck, which they do, but that way I'd be more excited to see a character all the way from Season 1 return. It's always great to see older characters get updated analyses, and this episode is no exception. The editing is at its absolute best. The way the hell that is presented feels like a professional promo video for the actual comics, and the escape section is such eye candy that appeals to my love for Synthwave. I love how with this cutaway, it serves to give Wiz a moment to geek out and appreciate a fellow scientist's work, while implying some less than noble planetary shenanigans as well. For Batman, they do such a good job balancing the meme side as well as what makes him so goddamn intimidating. It really feels like they understand his character with the way they describe his psyche and rules, and the final line for Tony's is super effective and tear-jerking. I suppose underneath it all, that man of iron had a heart of gold. As fun as it is seeing all the different armors discussed, hearing what makes these guys special as people is what makes this show truly special. Also, talking about all of those armors may or may not have shot this fight in the foot, but we'll get to that. One thing I really appreciate about this animation is the world building and how it considers the possibility of Marvel and DC heroes coexisting. The name drops feel natural, and you even get a sense of history between the characters, like without Tony knows Batman's secret identity. The dialogue in general has a great deal of respect towards these characters. Tony can be pretty full of himself, yet serious when the situation calls for it. Bruce may be stoic, but he manages to get his own one-liners in that feel natural to his attitude. He even has the initial instinct to escape and call Superman for help, only relying on the life-sucking Hellbat suit with no other option, the introduction of which really lives up to how much the show had been hyping it up. The way it emerges from the shadows and then immediately decks Tony with super crunchy sound design is massively effective, though I am pretty sad how much of the scene had to be removed from the storyboards. I'm in love with this entire sequence by the time they end up on the ground as the Hellbat mows down the entire house party protocol one by one and even if the scale isn't that big, moments like the burnt-out bat symbols leave an impact that most planetary explosions never could. Equally as gripping are the little moments like this raw neck crack and the detail that Tony had been hacking Bruce's suit the whole time. A great moment of strategy for Tony that's unfortunately lacking for Bruce. I'm sure y'all were waiting for this. And yeah, most of this fight, Batman just acts like a generic meathead, doing some pretty boneheaded things like not noticing a suit placed on him at the beginning and, oh yeah, destroying the very thing you are trying to protect as well as endangering the lives of a 
potentially millions. From now on, whenever a character does something really dumb for the rule of cool, let's refer to it as a watchtower moment. Bruce using the bats to confuse Tony's suits was really the only chess move he made the whole fight. Everything else was the equivalent of flipping the table and shooting the other player, whereas Tony got loads of moments to show off his intellect. That being said, this is still the best version of Batman we've gotten on the show, for the simple fact that he has an actual voice actor this time, in the form of Gianni no less, and he fits this role like a glove. No more armors, Tony. Just you and me. Man to man. Bust this. Reagan Murdoch is also great at selling the snark and the aha moments for Tony. I've got a suit for everything, Bats including busting wannabe gods like you. Had to divert some power to hacking that suit. Like I said, second grade. This fight pretty much suffers from the same issue as Steven vs. Star, where it's some great stuff, but not enough to satisfy, which is unfortunately inevitable when you discuss such a wide variety of armors these two can use that either don't show up or have next to no presence. It takes away from the climax, which on paper is a great idea. Leaving everything to fisticuffs after both parties have completely exhausted their resources is raw as hell. If more time had been spent seeing these two get worn down, then that would have been much more effective. And I personally don't buy the idea that the nano suit was on Bruce's per in the whole time. Did Tony not activate it because he likes fighting? It might be because he didn't want to resort to killing immediately, but that kind of takes a lot of tension out of the fight. And why would he just lunge at Bruce like this anyway when he could have just activated the armor while gloating? That way he wouldn't have to tangle with one of the greatest martial artists in comic book history. I feel like this lunge would have been more justified if Tony was placing the nano armor on Bruce right then and there. Either way, we'd still be able to get that badass death scream and funny skeleton. What puts this episode a tier above episodes like Korra vs. Storm and Steven vs. Star is its rewatchability, due in no small part to awesome sprite work and suit yourself. Talk about a banger and a half. The ACDC vibes are nigh omnipresent. I might as well be watching a music video with how well it suits this animation. Kinda sucks how much Brandon Yates was getting dogged with when is the track releasing questions after the episode went public. I fucking feel you there, buddy. While a longer runtime would have been ideal, this episode still does a great job of showing off these comic book icons in a strike and respectful way. Only real men listen to their J-pop out loud at work. Speaking of real men listening to their music out loud, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Definitely. Whoa, oh, oh. playing the original Goose Game. Geese Howard versus Heihachi Mishima. I wouldn't be surprised if Liam was assigned this episode just so we can make that one inside joke only a few people would get. The analysis is pretty good. They succeeded getting Heihachi's bull moose nature across as well as proving Geese is the world's buffest weeb. I'm happy Mecha Goose Howard shows up again, though I have to wonder what all the hate surrounding Jeff was about. Is this just another inside joke that I wasn't in on? Eh, well, it doesn't matter that much because the true star is this episode's animation, which I feel does a better job acting as a throwback to season 2 than Shadow vs. Ryuko. It may not be anything groundbreaking, but it's the simplicity of the premise in these fighters that wins me over. There isn't another setup more organic than these two leaving the ownership of their companies down to a tournament, and including Ringmaster is super inspired. Uh, flagrant disregard of antitrust laws, but okay! It's also fun imagining the idea of watching this fight from home live, making the final shot even more badass in turn. I've really gotta hand it to Sound Cadence for their authenticity in regards to casting. Not only getting a Japanese voice actor, but also one that sounds like he's in his 70s for Heihachi is no small feat. Kudos to Yoshi and Mao for making the character sound both badass and even cheeky despite the old age. <laughs> Brent Mackay does a tasteful rendition of Geese's infamous English that I thought couldn't be pulled off back in Captain Falcon's episode. He sounds like such a slimy monster with some of these line reads. It's great. I will stand my hands with your butt for that. It's been a while since the last Sprite fight was standout hand-to-hand -hand fighting, which is normally safe for 3D stuff. Ironically, despite being a different medium, this feels like a true spiritual successor to Ryu vs. Jin that is super faithful to Tekken's presentation by using choppy yet deliberate movements. The predictable running gag has a funny payoff, Kings of Iron makes me want to dance, this sweeping shot of the volcano is epic, the death is a nightmare fuel, and despite being one of the shorter fights this season, it actually does a great job of getting across our fighters' exhaustion after a hard-fought battle. I didn't feel that with Batman vs. Iron Man because it felt like so much was left out, but thanks to this episode's more straightforward premise, they were able to show off pretty much everything they needed to, making it badass in a humble way if that makes sense. Age was bound to catch up to these old farts eventually. <gasps> 
But Nate, shouldn't you be complaining about how annoying the Boomstick's dad jokes are? Oh, I mean, I guess it's kind of tired by this point. It could have been a lot worse, though, considering this episode's theme. Honestly, I'm mostly confused by the Elon Musk tangent for how long it is. What, did the guy make a deal with Death Bow behind the scenes or something? Well, I wouldn't be too surprised, given how much the guy loves making his fun little appearances here and there. Who knows, maybe he really wanted to be on the show and approached Ben and Chad with an elevator pitch. Oh, well played, my friend. I see. Too many swordsmen are there? Link versus Cloud Strife 2021. Now that's what I'm talking about. After all the teasing and inside jokes, Death Battle finally came through and gave us the universally most demanded rematch for the show. Get out of my house! Legend of Zelda may as well be my go-to video game series. So many of the mainline titles are among my greatest video game memories, and Final Fantasy is a franchise that should be held in high reverence, regardless of if you've ever played a game. The analysis segments for this one are... Weird, to put it lightly. Lynx does a pretty good job going through his near bottomless amount of weapons and spells, but it doesn't really focus that much on the lore or even Link himself. Hell, we don't even get a single Zelda name drop, which is more than odd. To be fair, it makes sense they wouldn't focus that much on Link. He's meant to be the blank slate after all, for gamers to feel like they're the heroes. But even then, Smash Bracket proved that just because a character is a blank slate, that doesn't mean you can't focus on more than just their arsenal. You could dissect their significance to the franchise and why they mean so much to us as the audience. The kind of courage that Link really embodies is the ability to look certain demise dead in the eyes and choose to fight to the end. And it's that exact trait that has made Link truly legendary. And while I can at least get where they were coming from with Link, what's not as understandable is Cloud's analysis. What the heck is up with this format? It's longer than his previous rundown, yet somehow they were able to go over his backstory and abilities in a much more cohesive manner in the analysis that's nine years older. I'm very confused by the whole Zack Fair bit and them trying to surprise us with a twist that they fabricated. I know Cloud having false memories is a big deal in the games, but it's just so oddly implemented here. And not unlike Steven Universe, Cloud feels kind of sidelined in favor of Materia and Summons, which is confusing since he's not a blank slate. I mean, yeah, he's kind of annoying and emo in Kingdom Hearts and Advent Children, but that's not the point. Fortunately for this episode, where it slips up in analysis, it more than makes up for with the animation, which has always played a bigger role in my scores. I'm not trying to devalue the importance of good analyses, far from it. But at the end of the day, a wonky analysis is much easier to look past than straight up bad animation which this animation is not. A major reason I and so many others were disappointed with Akuma Khan is because it was made by a team that we expect more from. You can't even blame the change in engines because this is the episode where the big software switch happened. SFM is SF dead. Blender is here to show us how it's done. With upgrades to software comes the chance to pull out and showcase even more crazy powers and weapons than before. And I couldn't think of a better episode to try this out on. It is ludicrous the amount of items and spells we get, a far cry from our last battle which limited itself on purpose. This makes the lack of a real setup tolerable, as the true star of this fight was getting to see our fighters' veritable versatilities play off each other. Despite this, and the lack thereof in the analysis, there's still loads of personality to enjoy. I am beyond thankful they went the badass in a dorky way route with Cloud, which is unequivocally the best version of the character. Adam Gibb gives his all with cool as a cucumber moments combined with the drive of an awkward warrior. Let's remove the asshole. Excuse me? Congrats on making the excuse me reference feel natural. It's not as colorful as other characters on the show, but there are ways to present characters other than just dialogue. This goes doubly for Link, who doesn't talk at all. Throughout the fight, we see a strategist who can constantly come up with on-the-fly solutions to any problem and adapt. Cloud, on the other hand, hits like a freight train, but this doesn't make him a wild swinging beast like last time. He's got the parries and the fake outs to keep his opponents guessing, and that's not even mentioning the materia. The most pleasant surprise was seeing the four swords get used. Each Link has its own personality and special specializes in different combat areas. It's rare that we get to see these kinds of team-up moments on the show. I love a good you set them up and I'll knock them down kind of move. Then again, I'll take black holes over clones any day of the week. This fight can be broken down into three sections. You've got the motorcycle fight. It's pretty neat and has some great shots, but it's nothing crazy. The middle section is where most of the materia and weapons get to shine. I love when questions in the research, such as could one of them get a lucky hit in with time stop, are showcased in the fight. And there's plenty 
of those moments all around. But once the cape is donned and the weather intensifies, we get the most beautiful looking shots in the episode. Once again, The Clash does a great job reflecting the research as Link dies, whereas Cloud is just winded. But then Mipha graces Link, and Fierce Deity shows up in one of the most awesome transformation scenes on the show with how stark the change in mood is. Cloud doesn't even risk trying to fight it, opting to go on the back foot and set up the killing blow from afar. Not too often you get to see a fighter win with brute force as well as strategy, but this doesn't mean they try to skip out on the force. That's what I love. With sound design that crunchy and by the virtue of not being a fuck off explosion, I'd posit this as the best looking death in the first half of the season. This entry got pretty long, and that's because there's so many bits and pieces working together to talk about, worthy of its own review even, all held together by final breath, complementing and elevating each of the scenes, including the Song of Storms bit, one of the only times I can think of where the music within the track had an actual effect on the events of the fight. I can't quite give this one a 9 though. On top of the strange analysis, there's also also some underdeveloped effects and strange shading issues. I'm sure all that technical stuff can be brushed off as nitpicking, but I really am trying to be more selective with my higher scores. Can someone remind me why I gave Thanos vs Darkseid a 10 again? Besides, everything else is super entertaining, including seeing Cloud biting it on the cliff. Suddenly all of my woes climbing wet mountains in Breath of the Wild feel vindicated. Yeah, go, go, yeah, go. JK, not dead, lol. Oh, right, my dead! Madara vs. Aizen. I'm not even going to pretend like I know what the hell Wiz and Boomstick were talking about. Naruto and Bleach are some of the most prolific and convoluted anime franchises out there, and this episode was all about the characters that play 5D chess for fun. That's what makes the analysis segment special to me, since these crazy stories were condensed in a digestible manner for an outsider like me. Even if I didn't retain every single thing, it was still entertaining, especially when our hosts got just as confused as me. Me. This may or may not be my favorite cutaway gag of the season, possibly the whole show. I'm kind of a sucker for the insane story gets explained by a whack job trope, the things this community will do to some people. I even like the Romeo and Juliet running gag for its consistency and payoff. I read it in iambic pentameter. Is there a gas leak in here? No, Wiz, the gas leak was last season. We've established this. Although it might explain why they went back to their older designs at the beginning. My opinion on this fight is kind of weird in simple terms. It has some rather glaring issues that can't be ignored, especially in the sneak peek area. We once again get this weird Weiss vs Mitsuru style intro where a scene is clearly missing that gives us proper context. Not to mention a majority of these movements are super stiff and unpolished. And once again we have yet another battle with odd pacing issues, except this time instead of not including enough stuff, I'd argue there's almost too many forms and abilities on display. We're forced to go through these transformations as quickly as possible due to the not so long runtime. It's not as egregious as something like Rock Lee vs Sanji, but it is kind of inevitable given the subset of franchises these characters come from. But you know what? I couldn't care less about these gripes because the positives might as well be black coffining these woes. Pretty much immediately after the sneak peek section, we get next to no jank at all with some of the smoothest sprite animations I've seen. The abilities of both fighters feel appropriately massive in scale, and while I would have preferred more fake outs, I think there were just enough to keep the audience guessing without getting repetitive. I'm still mesmerized by how this meteor shot was implemented. We haven't gotten a level of destruction like this since He-Man vs Lion-O. Even though the transformations were a tad rushed, the sprite work on each form is even more beautiful and well designed than the last. And after Aizen goes all butterfly on us, I'd argue the rest of what we get is easy 10 out of 10 material. I've seen some complaints about the dragon's frame rate, but to me it sort of adds this ethereal, otherworldly vibe to it. And it feels deliberate considering how smooth Perfect Susano looks, which is freaking beautiful. Then we get this breathtaking sequence of the clones versus the dragons, and finally we get to see the true colors of these Black Air Force Energy Chairmen. I was mostly cool with the voice performances up to now, but by the time Nicholas Andrew Louis got into his little monologue on why he loves the thrill of battle, I was convinced then and there that this is his best performance. I love it. The thrill of battle. The pounding of my heart. The taste of my own blood. I love it! It's certainly way more different than any of his other appearances, which is why it probably took a bit of getting used to at first. Philip Sacramento proves himself once again as an intimidating madman. Nothing escapes my illusions, human. No, you're 
Nice. And the two essentially become best friends once they get to their maniacal laughter contest. Or at least kindred spirits. And my god, does this climax deliver on the beautiful art and confounding mind games, being one of the only fake out deaths to legitimately trick some people, even if the music was still playing. Oh yeah, duh. Hollow Dreams is some of Brandon's best work. It's one of those songs that can be listened to on its own and you'd still get a full experience out of its intense vocals and rocking instruments. Once the death screams and destruction are finally over, there's nothing left to do but to sit back and acknowledge the wonderful dance along with Madara. There was no better way to end this as it gives us a moment to finally calm down as well as Madara a chance to acknowledge a worthy opponent. That level of nuance is always appreciated and it's clear by this point that Death Battle was getting much better and consistent at this aspect. And it's a shame that this episode was scheduled the way it was. If this was a finale that got the chance to have more resources poured into it for a longer fight then it would absolutely be a masterpiece. It's apparent that a few things had to give, such as removing a lot of the Black Coffin incantation, but with analysis segments this engaging and animation this stunning, this episode is nothing if not mind-blowing. I am the Dragon Warrior. You goddamn motherfucking stupid piece of shit! Iron Fist versus Poe. I just want to take a second and be real with you guys. I have absolutely nothing against Iron Fist or his fans but I didn't get hyped for this episode for the matchup. It was for that black and white bundle of Shashapui action himself, Master Zhao Po Ping. If Link vs. Cloud was my most wanted matchup this season, then Po might as well be my most wanted character. I knew this battle would be legendary, not just for introducing a character that has been a huge part of my and many others' childhoods, but for introducing our first animated movie character. I mean, sure, unless you count Dragon Ball. I don't. Come on, think about it, dude. This completely opens the floodgates for a treasure trove of untapped franchises. Yeah, that's nice and all. Just don't come crying to me when they announce Shrek versus Han Solo. Now, now, Wade. No need to be snarky this time. Everyone in this household loves Kung Fu Panda. The fight scenes, the humor, it's respect for ancient Chinese philosophies. Yeah, I was always more of an over-the-hedge guy myself. But I see what you mean. If I can will Omni-Man versus Homelander into existence, then maybe I could do the same with Groove versus Megamind. No need to thank me in advance, folks. Just be sure to watch Deadpool 3 whenever that comes out. Putting aside my blatant bias for Poe for a moment, which is very tough, mind you, this episode is truly wonderful, even reaching the same heights as the films at points, considering the differences in budget, at least. To the surprise of no one, Iron Fist had some stellar-looking visuals to accompany his comic panels, and it gave me a newfound appreciation of the character and his journey. It helps that they didn't make any obligatory Netflix jokes, which would have taken away from it, but it's Poe's segment that I keep coming back to each time. It is such a thrill hearing his franchise discussed in such an in-depth way, and I was very happy with the amount of respect given to Poe in regards to how he overcame his trauma and became a master in his own special way. Even Boomstick being surprised by the outcome doesn't come off as disrespectful, rather being indicative of the franchise's themes of misleading appearances. I didn't even realize there was a Boomstick's dad reference in this one. Except here, instead of bitterness, Boomstick shows genuine happiness towards Poe for rekindling the kind of relationship he never got to have with his own father. <laughs> Why you gotta be all emotional like that on me, Death Battle? We haven't even gotten to the fight yet! Yet. Despite being sprites, it does a really great job replicating the feeling and style of the Kung Fu Panda films. Let's face it, if this was done in 3D, the comparisons would have been inevitable and quite frankly unfair. What is comparable, however, is the tone, easily observable in Dragons and Dumplings, which does a great job of recapturing the whimsy and epicness of Hans Zimmer's soundtrack. And I'm glad they really leaned into the playfulness of this matchup. Jonathan Bullock gives a respectful take on Iron Fist, who at no point disrespects his opponent, giving him the benefit of the doubt when agreeing to a sparring match. And considering the Marvel Universe, I'd imagine Danny has seen crazier shiz than a talking panda. With you? <laughs> All right, buddy. Show me what you got. You're the power of cheese. It's equally important to note that it was Danny who suggested they start going all out, proving he saw Poe as his equal. Unsurprisingly, though, Austin Lee Matthews stole the show as Poe, to the point where people legitimately questioned if they somehow got Jack Black for this fight. I know the dude's expensive, but I can't say I'd be that surprised considering his appreciation for internet japes. Regardless, Austin recaptures that wide-eyed fanboy personality to a T. And aside from a couple grunts here and there, this is probably one of the closest voice matches we've gotten on the show. Wow! That was 
awesome! You were like, Wah! and then went, Sacha Booey! The dude even gives Mick Winger to run for his money. Still love that guy, though. The references were plentiful and never outstayed their welcome. I loved seeing the dumpling motivation implemented, and the stairs joke was super funny. This is another sprite fight with great hand-to-hand -hand choreography, but thanks to the use of environment and Poe's unorthodox fighting style, it manages to have even more memorable moments than Heihachi vs. Geese, the whooshy finger hold scene being one of them. It's one of the show's most beloved scenes for good reason. First off, the lead-in is quite brilliant, as it showed both fighters' intelligence. Danny allowed Poe to eat his bamboo so that he could get a solid hit in, while Poe figured out a means other than brute force to leave Danny open to his signature move. Poe's confidence in his one-lighter being immediately shut down is funny, and the following actions do a great job of reflecting the actual results. Because Danny is so much faster, Poe had to rely on his superior strength in order to take the fight to the spirit realm, which looks amazing. From here on, we get hits with loads of impact, epic music, and some breathtaking hand-drawn dragon brawling. I told you this fight could reach highs like the films. Unfortunately, the ending does not. The actual killing blow is kind of weak, even if it does look gorgeous, but what follows is an infamous watchtower moment where Poe acts quite jovial about killing a random dude. The Master Shifu name drop was appreciated, but I feel like a more serious, even somber tone akin to Storm's Farewell would have been beneficial. Regardless of the final seconds and odd jank throughout, I couldn't be more ecstatic to see Poe get his deserved spotlight on the show. I don't just love this episode because Poe won. I always prioritize representation over results, and it's clear the crew had a great deal of respect for both characters. Oh, and to those upset that a certain character wasn't name dropped. Tai Lung is the greatest <laughs> character ever. There you go. You happy now? Now it's been mentioned. <laughs> what else is there to say except skadoosh? Damn it! Am I, I rock the mic properly. Turn it off and touch on the funny joke. Yoda versus King Mickey. Talk about a tone setter. When Death Battle said every episode could be a finale and would have a special deep history with the show, a lot of us thought they were bluffing. But considering the star's two characters that were infamously banned by Ben himself from ever appearing and gave us a climax that might as well have come out of Kingdom Hearts, a lot of us were singing a different tune. Didn't Shadow vs. Ryuko come out immediately after this one? I, uh, it's got history, but that's not important right now. You know what I find weird about most Death Battle season premieres, hmm? To borrow some terminology from you versus debater people, they're either mid or trash? Exactly. You'd think Death Battle would try to put their best foot forward with their openers. While they've never been indicative of the season's actual quality, first impressions are still important. Miles vs. Static may have broken the streak, but it's nothing I'd really write home about. Yoda vs. King Mickey, on the other hand, uses two of the most iconic and recognizable characters in history, and it's relieving to see this level level of significance reflected in the episode. The analysis has the utmost respect for the characters. While they do criticize Yoda for his actions, this is in service of how he grew and would right the wrongs of his past. As easy as it would have been to rag on the cheesiness of Kingdom Hearts or portray Mickey as a cynical business mogul, I'm happy with how straight-faced everything was presented, aside from a couple minor jokes of confusion here and there. I am so used to seeing Kingdom Hearts treated like a joke, so it's always a breath of fresh air to see content made by unabashed fans of the franchise. I hope we're never coming back! Don't mind. This is gonna be dangerous, bear that in mind. Right. Pillows, just enjoy the ride. Even though the first cutaway lingered a bit too long, I at least thought the second one was cute, particularly with how the music was used. Boomstick, if you really want another beer, just go get one. Oh my god, it works! No, it was just me. Honestly, the entire score of these analysis segments help us get a feel for how grandiose and special these fighters are, making the lead-up to the fight all the more exciting. I think my favorite part about this fight is the tone. While there are plenty of grand abilities and dramatic moments, for the most part it takes a page out of All Might vs. Might Guy in the right way. It feels like two longtime friends having a friendly final battle to see who can come out on top after all these years of fighting. They complement each other, and any trash talk comes off as playful rather than malicious. This is the last battle done in SFM for the show, and it really feels like they wanted to put as much into this as possible to give the software a proper send-off. The spellcasts are beautiful, the environment itself is stunning and grand, and out of all the fights this season, it utilizes the camera the most exceptionally. It essentially took moments like the volcano scuffle and the multi-link bombardment and said, why don't we do that? 
that, but for literally the whole damn thing. It gives us fantastic shots like the lightsaber disarms and adds so much energy to the choreography. It's also used in more practical ways, like with Mickey's character model, which is rather infamous for not being able to emote things other than happiness. So they did what they could and used camera tricks to make it more expressive. An impressive combination of technology and creative problem solving, but great technology can't replicate good performances. And while most characters can get away with variations that at least sound like a fitting version, Yoda and Mickey would have been too iconic to get just anyone. This was Philip Sacramento's debut, and while I still love his following performances, this is definitely his best role to date. It's scary how close he gets to Frank Oz's vocal quirks. He even got down that wonderful laugh. Proof you are that size matters not. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, I cannot do the voice. Too bad we'll never know if he can replicate Yoda's death scream too. Ah! Mickey marks Keston Howard's third role on the show, and I don't think anybody could have seen a performance like this coming, at least when purely going off of Captain Falcon and freaking Machamp. Mickey is the kind of voice that's easy to do on paper, but once you actually try to act it out, especially for serious scenes, it's super easy to fall apart. Uh -huh. We just bought Fox. I can't do the voice! <laughs> <laughs> Despite this, Keston sold on the emotion as well as the playfulness. Hm. What a shame. I can try! All I need is the light! Do or do not. There is no try. I really love how they adapted Yoda's character arc into the fight by making him learn to rely on the Force. It's a sick as hell moment that even leads to him getting the upper hand. Mickey's on the back foot and this whole scene never fails to give me goosebumps. Could it be because of the voice acting or even the dialogue? I have a sneaking suspicion that a lot of it could be attributed to Hearts of Light, a score on the level of Weather the Storms when it comes to that cinematic feel. The orchestra reaches its crescendo, simple and clean can be heard, Yoda delivers one of his best lines, and despite the death of itself being kind of boring and sending an example for the rest of the season, it's the build-up and context that makes this one work. Be honest, who here honestly wanted to see Yoda get brutally murdered? Wade! That frog-munching goblin raided my fridge, rafikied me over the head, and still hasn't paid me back those $20 he borrowed. He had this coming. And yeah, the inclusion of Ghost Yoda was wholesome AF and a really clever way of ending this one on a positive note, which is really hard to do, considering. I'm surprised this episode doesn't top more people's lists. Even though we'd end up getting some more interesting action later on, there aren't that many other episodes that could truly match this one's level of genuine feels and good old-fashioned fun. Ugh, starting to feel kinda pukey from all this wholesomeness. Not to worry, Wade. I've got just the remedy for you. Pure evil! <laughs> Hold your fire! This man isn't black! What? Goku Black vs. Reverse Flash. When the world seems a bit too happy, always remember that there's an evil, petty, substantially more murdery version of yourself out there with an uncreative name to boot. Oh, I am well aware. For the final time, wishing someone wiped off the face of the earth is not the same as actively killing them. A certain chaotic hedgehog might beg to differ. Would you two shut up? There's only one of me here. I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to them. Who's them? I wish I knew. You could always check the link in the description if you'd like to know. Can you quit making yourself the center of attention for one minute? Well, excuse me for trying to cross-promote. I said shut up! I miss the old voices in my head. At least they weren't so squeaky. Wade, I think you might be insane. The following entries are in the upper echelons of my favorite episodes, well, ever. Everything about Thawne's analysis is basically perfect. The panel editing is insane and tells the story all on its own, without the need for sound effects. I knew nothing about Thawne going into this, and because of the history lesson, he's now one of my favorite villains ever because of how damn petty he is. That's the mark of an exceptional analysis, when you can sell outsiders on the character. Black's analysis, on the other hand, has always been put up to scrutiny, as it has a lot of those pacing issues we've seen before. In this case, it didn't bother me quite as much. The reason being being that while it spent a lot of time on what Goku can do, that feels in service to the overall story as it establishes why it's such a big deal for Zamasu to steal Goku's body and go injustice on everyone. I will concede that a few jokes don't land, but they didn't linger long enough to taint the experience. Besides, they get cancelled out by both cutaways which do a great job talking about time travel and why it's so stupid. But 
Goku met Black before he met Zamasu, which means Black existed before Zamasu came up with the idea. And then they killed Zamasu before he could do it anyway, but Goku Black was still- Oh, uh, okay, I get it. Who would have thought the worst part of time travel was constantly fucking having to explain what's happening? It's always humorous to me seeing people get confused by time bullshit, and on top of being funny, it shows how scary these two are for becoming living paradoxes. Able to do whatever they please without any consequences, and boy does that show in the animation. We've gotten some time travel episodes in the past, but they always felt pretty tame so that things wouldn't get too confusing, even if it ends up creating paradoxes anyway. Here though, the crew decided to go ham and really roll with the concept of these two being removed from time. Combine that with their maniacal tendencies, and you could tell that the choreographers were able to do whatever the hell they felt like, making this one brutal in the most fun way. It was so hype seeing them time travel to previous points of the animation, and just indiscriminately kill as many versions of themselves as possible while having fun doing it with no regard for others. The level of destruction we get is insane! It's nice to see scale being utilized for once with two super destructive characters. The Unreal Physics makes shots like the Moon Punch and Black's Kamehameha Wave look beautiful. There's also a lot of little details that carry this fight to the next level, like how Black's clones are denoted by a different hair color, past Thawne being unfazed by future Thawne's arrival and joining in on the laughter, or the fact that Thawne only gets hit at points where he's caught off guard. Can we talk about Thawne? Let's talk about Thawne. I've been wanting to talk about Thawne all day. No joke. This is one of the best character portrayals we've gotten on the show. He's such a slimy, proud bastard the entire time, and it makes for great TV. He initiates the fight in the pettiest way possible. He interrupts Doc Brown mourning Kara to use him as a meat shield, even though we know full well he didn't need to. And his shit-eating grins are the stuff of legends. Seriously, these are some of the best faces we've gotten on the show, both sprites and hand-drawn. His pettiness can't even be bound by the confines of this episode, as they retroactively explain why Quicksilver died, making that episode slightly better. Still not good, mind you, but it's something. All this is brought to life by Valentine Stokes, one of the most galaxy brain casting decisions on the show. This is actually a reprisal for the guy, and you'll never guess where from. It was me, Barry. I jerked you off at super speed so it'd seem like you nutted at just a woman's touch! They even worked the line into the episode! Holy shit, these people are geniuses! They weren't kidding about the hypnotic voice ability. I'll end this fight before it even began. Dacked in reverse! Michael Kovach, who played Shazam last time, is equally great as Goku Black. Not only is he great at being just as petty, some of these line reads are insanely good with the intensity, with one of the best Kamehameha screams and arguably one of the best death screams in death battle history. To stand atop all things and look down upon creation itself, that is the work of a god! But the climax is one for the books, y'all. This face and dialogue were destined to go down in infamy, and the crew likely knew that going into it. Thawn could have ended it in any way he wanted to, and it's pretty in character for him to go with the most brutal route there was. Sorry, was that important? Ah! And he was still alive after being dragged around the earth! Holy hell, this fight is brutal! This matchup doesn't exactly have some deep history with the show, but you can tell this was a passion project through and through. It didn't have any issues in regards to not doing enough with the characters, because they pushed the bounds of this fight to its absolute limit, both in scope and petty chaos. All set to Reverse Rosé, hands down one of Brandon's most iconic tracks. Aside from a few hiccups slash parts in the analysis, this is an episode that gives me very little to actually complain about. But I'm sure the Dragon Ball fans had a little to complain about now that their insane win streak has finally been breached. This episode definitely came out at the right time though, since that fandom was starting to get a little greedy. Remember kids, no matter how powerful your favorite character is, there will always be some universal DC character out there that's even stronger. Even if your character is actually stronger, they're still probably gonna lose. Man, time travel really is bullshit. Hey y'all, Scott here, and this is bad. Real bad. And before you ask, yes! This is a JoJo reference! Part 1 was the best. Ah, oh, you would say that, you fucking Brit. I prefer part 2. Dio Brando versus Alucard. The diabolical fun just keeps on coming. When they said they were doing a season focused on history, there was one matchup that was on everyone's mind. You mean, other than Master Chief versus Samus and Galactus versus Unicron? Okay, well that's- You know, I wonder how the infamous and prototype fans are holding up. I get it. This is the kind of matchup you would put 90% of your savings on in Vegas, with the 10% being benefit of the doubt just in case. Not only did it have two separate instances in past 
last videos of foreshadowing, but it's been talked up and debated within the community for years, essentially becoming Liam's baby. We all knew going in that it would be nothing short of a passion project. These analysis segments are really solid stuff. It was a nice redemption for JoJo's considering the last episode didn't go so hot, and I was really appreciative of the greater emphasis on their stories with moves and abilities discussed organically. Even with Alucard, the decision to save his real backstory for closer to the end was meant to parallel how we learn about it in the manga. The references all felt deliberate too, since a lot of them wound up appearing in the animation, and it helped outsiders get in on the joke. As for gripes, personally I feel like the cutaway lingers a little too long, but I like how they gave Wiz and Boomstick Alucard and Dio's powers respectively, and 99 Bottles is such a perfect stand name for Boomstick. What do you think my stand would be called, Wade? I don't know. Unicorn Wizard? Shit, that's good. On to the fight, we pick up where our last entry left off by celebrating all things villainous. Is Alucard a good guy? Well, technically, but my god is he good at being bad. Out of all the fights this year, this one just feels like the most natural crossover. The moment Alucard takes one look at Dio, that'd be an obvious shoot first, ask question later type deal for him. No camaraderie, no friendly banter, not even a sort of twisted kinship like in Madara vs. Aizen. You can tell these two fucking hate each other, and it's great to see these these monsters go all out. By God, do they go all out. So many of my favorite exchanges and set pieces this season come back to this episode. Grabbing the knives from a nearby store called Knives Inc. Genius. Using their clothes to show battle damage despite both of them having broken healing factors. Creative. Using the steamroller, hilariously inevitable. Sword fighting with Big Ben's clock hands? Literally, how do you come up with something like that? There are so many awesome hand-drawn frames and sprite portraits that may as well be inducted into the Death Battle Hall of Fame. These two shots in particular are my favorites. I love the parallelism and showing that the tides of battle have changed. Speaking of tides, talk about a season 8 shot. I can't think of a better way for them to have pulled off level 0. I can only imagine the amount of technical expertise that went into making this. On paper, you'd think using Marvel vs. Capcom 2 sprites for the whole army would look lazy, but it somehow works in a way that I can't even explain. So instead, I'll go over the true driving force that has made this into a modern classic in Death Battle's lineup. It's portrayal of Alucard and Dio Brando. Starting with the No Life King, Curtis Arnott was kind of a no-brainer for bringing him to life, more or less. He has such a bassy boom and really drives home the idea that Alucard is this terrifying eldritch abomination that even vampire tyrants piss their pants at the sight of. Normally I take issue with the final form coming so early, but it works because not only do they do everything and more with it, to me this is Alucard quickly realizing the kind of opponent he's fighting. That's why he sounded so overjoyed when transforming. I'm gonna enjoy hearing you scream. There's even an additional line which didn't make the cut that drives this point home even further. This is more fun than I've had in a while. <laughs> Dio is a pure monster, and Alucard doesn't have to hold back. It ain't over until all hell sings, and sings Dio does. If you count the screams of writhing agony as singing, of course. Not only was it great to hear Curtis as the Vampire King again after so long, it was so cool hearing him play a more accurate, less quippy version of the character while still keeping the tones we're all familiar with. It just works, and I'm glad they showed self-control by making only one abridged reference, which they did a good job with picking. What the hell are you? A real fucking vampire. When hope is gone, undo this lock and send me forth on a moonlit walk. Release restraint level Zero. On to Dio. When it came to voice actors, I was fully expecting Curtis to lead the charge overall. So imagine my surprise when Tom Shulk, yes that one, came in and stole the show like a true villain. He just brings so much energy. He manages to chew the scenery both when he's smug and in a disadvantaged state. Every one of his yells has so much vigor and life to them, making the hits feel far more impactful. It's kind of inspiring as a fellow voice actor. I want to rule the world! But what I find really interesting was the way they treated Dio's character and made the fight seem close yet realistic despite the results being anything but. So long, Methuselah! <laughs> In the beginning, Dio starts out totally full of himself and barely breaks a sweat. You thought you'd triumph, but it was I! Dio? 
Then Level 1 managed to take him completely off guard, only for him to find his footing once more. But once Level 0 appears, even the world is terrified at the Pandora's box they've inadvertently unleashed. Despite being one of the most broken anime villains of all time, Dio is anything but careless. So when a power comes up that he doesn't immediately understand, he won't risk things by charging in blindly. That's why it's totally believable for Alucard to be owning him throughout this section. Dio is deliberately choosing to remain on the defensive until he can finally figure out Alucard's deal. Once the army was dealt with, the Vampire King was all but dethroned, and Dio wanted to relish in that coup d'etat and make sure Alucard knew it. <laughs> Whenever people ask me what the perfect sprite fight is, I would say Kirby vs. Majin Buu, but when it comes to the modern era, this one is my go-to. I love everything about it, and that of course includes Hell Over Heaven, one of my favorite season 8 tracks, only third to suit yourself and the upcoming one. The chilling strings and rocking guitars make it equal parts suspenseful and adrenaline fueling. I must have rewatched those final 20 seconds countless times just for the guitar solo alone. Well, also for Tom's amazing pipes. <laughs> You don't have to be a dick about it. This is a matchup that's been hyped up forever, and it really warms my heart to see Liam's brainchild live up to the fanfare. I was concerned that this would be a hated episode considering how much of the general public assumed Alucard won, but thanks to the detailed ending analysis that left no stone unturned, it ended up becoming a runaway success. Good to see they've learned their lesson from last time. Time, huh? Thanks for the- Ow! So does that mean you'll finally stop complaining about this episode being wrong, Steve? Huh. Interesting. Knowing this channel, I could have sworn that would have set something off. I did it ironically, so I think we're safe. Saitama vs. Popeye the Sailor Man Well, here we are, folks. We finally made it to the entry that I've been dreading the most. Normally, that kind of anxiety is for things that are really bad. In this case, it's the exact opposite. This is the kind of episode that's so good, finding the right words for it will be something of a Herculean task. Don't worry, I'm not ending this vid on another cliffhanger. Lord knows those have always come to bite me in the ass. That being said, doing this one justice with the limited time I have left is close to impossible, but we will soldier on and give it our best damn shot. So what do you say, Wade? Ready to take this plunge together and- I heard what you said about Dio versus Alucard, you little bitch. Ah, uh, there it is. Oh my gosh, it's Steve, real life friend of Raccoon Bro and frequent troll lingering in his comments. Why did you say like, whatever, I'm here to break the silence and let you know that Dio versus Alucard sucks because it's fucking wrong. This guy's not for serious, right? Not even Carrick's friends know for sure. Oh, believe me, I know the episode's right. I still disagree with it, though, because Alucard's cooler. Duh. Well, this guy's got the winning personality of a butthurt weeb. Glad to know Raccoon Bro's hanging with his equals. I can't even imagine how he feels about this entry. Saitama vs. Popeye? Oh, that shit top five all time. What? Yeah, it has a surprisingly funny analysis section, a great dynamic between the two characters, and a cool-ass fight that's up there with some of the greatest the show has put out. Why would I hate it? That's it. I have given up on understanding the internet. You guys banter all you want. I'm gonna take a nap. At the end of Madara vs. Aizen, everyone and their grandmother was on the edge of their seat to see what the hell would be the finale of a season meant to be full of finale-worthy episodes. Obviously, the first thought was something like Galactus vs. Unicron or Goku vs. Superman 3, but what we got was a lot more interesting. When Saitama showed up, the world was scared. When Popeye appeared afterward, the response was a giant mixture of overwhelming joy and straight-up confusion. A Toon Force character for the season finale? Cause that worked so well the last time, obviously. But I I was among those who were super excited because Toon Force characters are in short supply on this show. And it's Popeye the fucking Sailor Man! This fight would be nothing if not an epic showcase of absurd fisticuffs chicanery. When I saw Saitama, I was very concerned that we would get Superman or Goku as his opponent because, well, those matchups suck. But when it was revealed to be Popeye, I was pleasantly surprised and deeply excited, mainly because of the matchup. Old versus new, East versus West, anime bullshit versus Toon Force. Plus, it was a matchup that that no one saw coming. I couldn't help but be hyped. Saitama? Oh, 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 yes! Yes! Oh my god!
I didn't know how the fight would go, but I knew if done right, it could be something special. Starting with the analysis, the Rooster Teeth version, not the YouTube version, damn you copyright, Steve wasn't kidding before. It is seriously funny, mostly because of the stark contrast, something that makes this matchup fun in the first place. You've got Saitama's, which, while full of insane feats, is still treated quite seriously. There's the way it goes in depth on how exercise works, and what makes Saitama such a compelling character despite never struggling. That's the whole point, because life without struggle is a boring nightmare, which is why it's important to enjoy the little things. I can certainly relate given how much I had to struggle getting the Red vs. Blue review out. Do you ever shut up about that show? Hey man, when you've had to deal with the same video on the back burner for 12 months, you can get back to me on what I should shut up about. Besides, getting it out was super rewarding. Was it super rewarding cracking 2,000 views a month after its release? Just get back to the fucking review. With pleasure. While Saitama was played seriously, Popeye's analysis was when shit got wacky, leading the host to break through the absolute absurdity of Popeye and his feats. It was great how much footage of Popeye was used, even addressing some of the stereotypes in a tasteful way. They spent an entire fucking section on big green spinach while Boomstick's mind just went to fucking mush. All of this neatly tied together with some really good edits from the team, painting the lunacy of Popeye's strength and his propaganda to eating healthy. It worked. There were some complaints that Popeye spent too much time on the absurd things he's done as opposed to the character himself, but I feel like they did a good job paying respect to an iconic cartoon heavyweight champion. When you're analyzing a character that has done so many absurd things over the years, the comedy writes itself essentially, and I think it ties into the simplicity of his character versus the existential dread Saitama goes through on a daily basis. It's two totally different ways of writing an overpowered character, and that's what makes their ultimate meeting so fun. I can't think of a more appropriate setup for this fight. Going to the store is a staple in Saitama's humor, a level of mundaneness which is then immediately leveled by Popeye popping out of the damn can. I'm just going to assume that the decimal is meant to be a comma, not a period, otherwise Saitama's too poor buy an 11 cent can. Honestly though, I buy that possibility too. I've seen his apartment. But 11 fucking dollars for- wait shit. But 11 fucking dollars for a can of spinach? That shit better give you the powers of God and Anna. Oh wait, the fight starts and the animation's not only very clean, but also filled with the fighting styles of both shows. From Popeye sending Saitama out of the store through the power of slapstick, later fixing the store by just lifting it, to a more shonen style after Saitama punches Popeye, followed by after images and nut shots. You know, shonen staples. This contrast is present throughout the whole animation, by the way. Saitama uses a more straightforward brute force approach for breaking the rules, whereas Popeye never even got the rule book. Always stretching, pulling out weights, and making quagmire references. A common complaint is that Saitama acts out of character by immediately going for the death punch instead of a more casual one. Well, considering he's facing a dude that climbed out of a fucking spinach can, I think Saitama could tell that he wasn't facing a normal human being. Also, time. You just had to bring up time in front of me. Hi, Steve. Hi, Hi Steve. <laughs> oh, what's the matter? Fuck you. Do you not like it? Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna put that in your goddamn video. I hope your parents are happy with it. <laughs> You'll notice that up to this point, the music has all been very Popeye-esque and meant to be listened to with the visuals in mind, such as how it lines up with all of Popeye's crap falling on the ground. Blah. It does wonders in elevating the timing of the comedy, and it means that we get an even longer fight that isn't limited to a single soundtrack. But once the main track kicks in, it goes so damn hard! Balderdash is my favorite track this season, and I don't think I'm splitting any hair saying that. The guitar riffs are so raw, even more so than any other heavy hitters like Four Fist Death Punch. And I'm glad it goes so hard because it fits the chaos and energy of the fight. Not to mention it goes through multiple styles as the fight progresses, and this is where the whole thing begins to feel like a finale. I've had to make arguments for episodes in the past for them being finale worthy, and even if the matchup itself is a cool closer, it's a bit difficult for these episodes to stand out from the rest of the crowd. Then Saitama vs Popeye came in and there was literally zero debate. The inclusion of the different animation styles served as a great way to make the fight feel bigger in the grand scheme of the show, and it's the perfect way to end a season meant to celebrate the show's history by paying homage to the different animation styles we're used to. While the sprites and blender sections aren't quite as good as the hand-drawn stuff, which 
which is honestly kind of inevitable, they still both have their own level of charm to bring to the table. The sprites sort of pay homage to classic arcade games, which is funny because of what the original Donkey Kong was supposed to be. They even had an arcade view for a couple of seconds. And this fight was supposed to be just punches, right? The blender section can only be described as Devil Artemis doing cool shit, which is literally what the storyboard was. So naturally, it was filled with cool shit. Flurry punches that were good, planets getting destroyed with impact, Saitama standing there menacingly, Death versus Spinach, Jojo Popeye. It's filled with cool shit. What else is there to say? I wouldn't be surprised if Jojo Popeye ends up haunting people's dreams, but it feels like one of those hyper-realistic creepypastas you hear about. That shit just makes me laugh. Let's creepypasta it. <laughs> <laughs> and the reveal was so funny and badass at the same time. I don't even mind them using the death punch again because the spinach reveal right after was just too perfect. This shit is so cool that it doesn't go unnoticed by the characters. We've yet to really discuss the dynamic of Saitama and Popeye. Sure, we've talked about their differing powers and rules, but that's not what makes these two special. Saitama has been his usual, unimpressed self for a good majority of the battle, barely even taking an interest with Popeye's shenanigans at the start. Meanwhile, Popeye has been taking the whole fight seriously. Well, as seriously as a character like him can. He still cracks jokes and even shows plenty of respect for Saitama's ability to hang with the punches. Once he grabs his spinach can, things start to escalate, and Saitama very gradually gets more into the fight and even begins to show surprise at Popeye's crazy anatomy. All the aliens and scientific experiments in the world couldn't have prepared him for someone like Popeye. Now hold on, hold on, we do gotta talk a little bit about the voice actors, since I know you hate voice actors. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help it, couldn't help it, man. Alright, okay, I'll redo it. Now, 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 we gotta talk a little bit about the voice actors before getting to the climax. Liam Swan as Popeye is a really fucking good performance. He's got Popeye's grunts, his random mumblings, and even hit them high notes like he was Celine Dion. Okay, I'm lying a little bit about that last part, but he did sing well. It was obvious that Liam was having a blast. You couldn't hear an impersonation. You simply hear Popeye, which is all you need for a character like that. That's all I can stand, cause I can't stand no more! Ryan Abedi dons the bald cap for Saitama. His performance starts off as monotone throughout most of the fight, while gradually putting more of his all into the yells and emotions, which makes sense because it's Saitama gradually taking the fight more seriously. It never sounds phoned in though, so it's better than a Steven Seagal performance. Anyway, Ryan's performance really shines in the final 2D animation section after getting thrown around by the Antichrist that is Jojo Popeye. As the planet is drawn in and Saitama is given a moment to reflect on the situation, a noticeable switch has been flipped. You can hear the overwhelming joy in his voice after realizing he finally got what he wanted. A serious fight. It's the perfect way of doing the shonen hype up scene we see all the time, but instead of making it about, I must go beyond because my friends need me, it's Saitama happy he can actually try for once in his life. I know, right? Overwhelming strength is so boring. I never thought it would happen. A serious fight. I found it! I will never forget the feeling of happiness that washed over me when this moment played. I wasn't sure if they'd actually go through with it, but the Mad Lads managed to make me tear up at an animation where Popeye jumps off the freaking sun. It's a rare instance for Death Battle as it provides a character with a moment that's wholly unique to the animation, and yet it feels so natural to the original source material's philosophy. We want to see Saitama feel again, and it's unclear if we'll ever get that in the actual manga. But if it does happen, it'll have a hard time competing with the imagery of Saitama crying tears of joy through space and laughing on the way to his ultimate destiny. It is impossible for me to think of- Thank you, weird spinach mascot. Without resisting the urge to burst into tears, it's simply beautiful. The ultimate killing blow was indeed epic. Saitama turning into eggs was a no-brainer, and I'm pretty proud of myself for realizing that immediately, whereas it took many others a few seconds. I'm an egghead. I also like the detail that Popeye got up kind of groggy from the ground. It helped to make the whole fight feel closer than it really was, and felt very respectful of Saitama as a contender. And yeah, the final bit with Popeye singing a variation of his theme couldn't have been a more appropriate way to round off this roller coaster of a fight on a lighthearted note. It at least felt more natural than Iron Fist vs. Poe. This was just another Tuesday for our sailor man. I still can't get over the fact that this dude killed a man in front of Paramountain. He will face war cries for his atrocities, but no, let's just sing about it. He took a big gamble, but now he is scrambled. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. 
I mean, we've been singing this episode's praises for the last 10 minutes, so I don't blame him. I really enjoyed the analysis segments not just for the fun of applying real science to cartoon bullshit moments, but for contextualizing what makes OP, anime, and Toon Force so fundamentally different from each other. With Rubber Hose Animation, it's never been about saving the world or growing to become the very best. It was simply about having fun and taking advantage of a medium that can pull off gags in situations that'd be impossible in live action. Like I said, impossible in live action. And if Saitama was given any other opponent for a more serious battle, Death Battle would never hear the end of it, which was really smart of them. We don't know Saitama's limit. If we did, it would defeat the whole purpose of his series. So pinning him against a character like Popeye felt like a natural and refreshing take on the whole OP heroes trope we've gotten so accustomed to in this community. And before anyone asks, yes, Popeye could beat Goku. The animation, no matter the medium, is fluid and bouncy, serving to give these two a natural crossover by taking inspiration from the best parts of their shows. The dynamic felt natural and served to make the Toon Force bits even funnier. Balderdash is the supreme theme for high-octane action. The voice actors give it their all and elevate these characters to the next level. But more importantly, even if it's not your favorite, I think the whole community can agree that this truly feels like no other episode of the show. I don't consider myself a member of the Versus community or the Death Battle community at all, but I have been following the show for years, since before Pro Jared left Screw Attack. Yes, I'm that old. And over the years of watching the show become what it is today, something about it just seems missing from the earlier days. Not dissing any of the current episodes at all, there's still loads of high quality content, but something seemed lost ever since Screwtech started to die. Like yeah, Hulk vs Broly is a great episode, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't have the same magic that Balrog vs TJ Combo had, which is my favorite episode of all time. Part of this may be because Death Bell has an actual release schedule instead of the old it's out when it's out mentality. Not true for most, but it's still kind of there and it's been like that for a while now. Not saying that's bad, mind you, just something that would naturally happen when you implement a pipeline. Nothing will ever quite match the flying by the seat of their pants mood season 1 and season 2 had. I feel the same way about almost all recent episodes of Death Battle. None of them had the same magic episodes like Pokemon vs Digimon or Goku vs Superman had when they first dropped. All except Saitama vs Popeye. It was the first time in a long time I felt the same joy I did watching the earlier seasons. The fact that they went the extra mile and added sprites and 3D to the fight made it seem more important than your standard season finale. But the main reason why I like it, it's because it's the ultimate celebration of death battle. The show has been around for 10 fucking years. And at its core, the show is a celebration of the media we enjoy. Saitama vs Popeye is not only a celebration of the shows they are from, but the genres they represent, the cultures they originate from, and just as well, the show we all learned to love all those years ago. Now that makes it magical. Well said, Steve. I never took you for a sentimentalist. I have a giant penis. Deal versus Alucard is still right, you know. You are literally a fucking JPEG. Screw you, I'm going home. It's a PNG and you know it! Oh, whatever, let's just finish this already. I'll admit, as much praise as this season gets for taking Death Battle to the next level, there's a sizable number of episodes that don't really hold up. There's only a couple I would call outright bad, but about 40% of this season's lineup could be classified as missed opportunities. Just think about the number of times I've had to say something along the lines of, it was good, but it could have been better. Which is funny, because I've rarely took note of episodes being too short before this in past season reviews, and I think I know why. Season 8 was simply way too ambitious. Okay, I know I sound like a total jerk for saying that, but hear me out. Remember, the mission statement was to do matchups that could each be considered finales, and you could tell that they really wanted to do that with as many iconic matchups as possible. That's why fights like Batman vs. Iron Man and Steven vs. Star leave quite a bit to be desired, because they absolutely could be finales, but they're not. Saitama vs. Popeye is, and that's why it's so great. It had the time and resources of a proper finisher that simply aren't feasible for earlier fights, making those shortcomings stick out even more. And there is simply no defending the Boomstick's dad arc. Aside from Hulk vs. Broly, which was in Season 7, mind you, it didn't make me laugh once, it was always the worst part of each analysis segment, and it had such a nothing payoff. Now, with all that being said, 
I still fucking adore this season. As detrimental as the ambition could be at times, it still managed to give us some of the most beloved and destined to be iconic moments in the series. Even if the analysis portions had some pretty groan-worthy jokes, it still marks an impressive leap forward for Death Battle in regards to how characters and their stories are approached. Not to mention the editing, which is easily the best these sections have ever looked. With all the new sprite animators and Blender artists on board, we've gotten a plethora of amazing looking sequences and stills that could reasonably be framed in one's room. Even the most mid episodes have been able to provide us with beautiful imagery and memorable interactions. And while I wish there could have been more episodes to really vibe with me, I wasn't kidding when I said the best of this season are easily my favorite episodes ever, to the point where I'm willing to overlook the more rough around the edges parts. And like Steve said, it's been a while since the show really felt like magic, and the best of this season managed to touch me in a way that I'll never forget. It's not quite my favorite season, that honor still goes to season 6, but you'll be hard pressed to find another show on the internet with as much passion, drive, and dedication as season 8, and I can't wait to see what the future has in store for us. I... I did it! I finally did it! I caught up on Death Battle! Now the show has to catch up to me! I can talk about something that isn't versus related! Not so fast, Buster Brown. The heck is this? That is a coupon for one free video idea, which you gave to me as an olive branch for Thanosing me. There's no not so smooth talking your way out of this one. You've gotta make it. All right, let's see what the damage is. This just says your name, but the first syllable is in bold. Let's just say your next video will be to die for. <laughs> It's best deaths, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's best deaths. 